Hi everybody, and welcome to my video introducing the Kodak Brownie 3 Model B box camera. Uh, previously I did a video on my Raleigh Flex uh, old standard and said that was my oldest camera. Well, since I filmed that video, I've gotten this camera. This is new to me. And this is now my oldest camera. <laughs> uh, so this is this is only going to be one video because this is a pretty simple camera. We're going to stray from the two video format for this. But as you can see, there's not a whole lot here to talk about. So we're going to go through it in the same basic way that we do the others. This is a box camera that takes roll film. And what that means is if you've ever seen a roll of 120 film, you've got film that's on spindles and it has a paper backing that's separate from the film. And that was a pretty big innovation back in the day. This was the third or fourth camera that Kodak made which used roll film. The original Brownie, the Kodak Brownie box camera, was the first camera Kodak made that used roll film. And it was a pretty big innovation back in the day. Uh, it has a meniscus autochromat... I'm sorry has yeah an autochromat meniscus lens so that's the shutter right there behind the shutter is the lens and it's a single piece of glass shaped like a meniscus that's why it's called a, a meniscus and the autochromat means something it has a rotary shutter so what I'm going to show you is what that means here's the shutter button on the side here let's see if I can get some better lighting in there. That works. You might be able to see a little flash there and you can hear the sound. What happens is when you move the shutter up or down it it, it, it trigger it moves this little rotor back and forth in front of that's in front of the lens and allows light in or out. This was a pretty advanced camera for its day because it has three aperture settings and an instant setting which is about one I don't know exactly how fast it is. It's somewhere between a 35th and a 50th of a second. And it also had a time setting for longer exposures. And you actually don't have to reach in, it's just easier for me since I have no fingernails and no pain tolerance to reach in and trip the lever. But you can see, when I trip the lever, it now stays open for as long as I have the lever in place instead of that quick opening. So that's the shutter. That's how the shutter works. And that's really all there is to, uh, to this camera. Now there were three different shutter speeds for the Kodak Brownie number 3 Model B. There was 135th, um, or 140th in that range, 145th and 150th, and there were designations F for 150th, a dot for 145th, and S for 135th or 140th. I have no idea where those designations are. I literally took the front of this camera apart. I had this camera completely taken apart last night, and I could not find where those designations are located. So, it's not on the back. All that says is use number 124 film and brownie and then on the little the little plate on the back says uh, made by, uh, made in USA by Eastman Kodak Rochester so there's no place that I've been able to find on this camera that tells me how fast the shutter speed is it has as I mentioned it has this aperture I'm gonna set this to time again the way you're actually supposed to do it is pull that lever up. So you can see inside of it, you can see the lens, and you can see as I pull this lever up that, that increasingly smaller holes move in front of the lens. So this actually has three aperture settings. So because it has a single shutter speed, the only way to control your exposure is to adjust the aperture. So the smallest aperture is f22, F16, F8. It has uh, no flash sync, no meter, it's 
completely manual. In fact, it's made out of wood and leather and a few pieces of metal, but mostly it's made out of wood. It has two viewfinders. These two dots right here, these are two little glass lenses, and one of them is for landscape viewfinding, and the other is for portrait viewfinding. There we go. So you can see through the portrait viewfinder the studio lamp off to the side. It's actually just a, a shop lamp. And let's see if we can do something similar here. Uh, you can kind of see the light from it. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get it. But anyway, so the way you would use this is when you're taking your picture, you'd hold your eye up to this and you hold it a, you know, a few inches away and you would see your, your scene through it. There'd be a little, little bit of parallax but uh, you would then take your picture. Same thing with the landscape, only rotated a little bit. I was unable to find out how much parallax exactly exists, though it's worse, worse at close range than distant range. Let's imagine, let's say that this is what you're taking a picture of, and this is your lens, and this is your viewfinder. So the lens is seeing the image this way, and the viewfinder is seeing the image this way. So if you're taking a picture of something here, there's a much steeper angle than if you're taking a picture of it here or if you're taking a picture of something over here. That's how parallax works. It's a difference between what the lens sees and what the viewfinder sees. These are pretty close together, so it's not going to be huge, and this lens, this lens isn't going to focus much closer than about, oh, probably five or eight feet. So it really would be a non-issue for this camera. Uh, later cameras, where you could adjust the, fo the focus to be much closer, w it would have been an issue on. And it remains an issue on some modern viewfinders, in fact. Uh, let's see. The target market for this camera was snap shooters. Like basically everything Kodak, Kodak made its cameras for the everyday photographer, somebody who just wanted to get an inexpensive camera that they could take to the beach. And to that end, when this camera was released, the first year that it was released, which was 1908, it cost $2. And a lot, some of the online resources said it cost $4 for its entire production run. That was incorrect. I found some ads for this camera from, from the, up through about 1914, it cost $2. And then it went up to $4 in the, uh, sometime before 1921. And uh, so at the end of the production run, it was a $4 camera. And it was produced from 1908 till 19... Uh, I'll get to those parts of my outline later. I need to stop getting going off the outline. The slogan for the camera, and, be, and, and this was interesting. I found this on one of the ads. The slogan was, for good pictures, the easiest way at the smallest cost. And having an advertising background, and a marketing background, it would be unfair to say I have an advertising background. Having a marketing background, that's kind of a terrible slogan. It's too many words. It's, it's ten words. It's not beyond the realm of acceptable, but it is kind of a lot of words. And there's a few too many concepts, but back in the day, that kind of marketing worked as evidenced by how great a company Kodak was for such a long time. So, uh, these, these cameras were, oh, so like I said, they were made of wood with some pressed metal on the inside. And, that's, and they were very simple to make, very quick to, to churn out. In fact, in their production run from 1908 to 1934, more than 254,000 of the Kodak number no. 3 brownies were produced. I couldn't find a breakdown of how many were Model Bs and not Model Bs and of each of the different variants. But that's still a lot of cameras, even though it had a, uh, what is that, a 20, uh, 26 year production run. Is that right? 34? That's not, yeah, 26. So that's a pretty impressive number. That's about 10,000 a year, which, if you assume five days a week of production, that's 250 days a year. 10,000 divided by 250, that's 400 a day? I don't know. I don't do math very well, and I just thought on the fly that would be a good thing to do. It's some large number of these a day. But it's impossible to date these based on a serial number because they don't have a serial number. So, 
uh, there is some information about these available that will help you get a range for how old your Kodak number 3 Brownie is. From 1908 to 1911, they made the original Kodak number 3 Brownie. After 1911, it said Model B. So you can see there it says Model B. That means that this was made after 1911. Uh, in 19, so it was. They changed to the Model B in August 1911. Okay. Now further, you might not be able to read this, but it says U.S. patents October 6th 1914, February 1st 1916, and March 21st 1916. So we know that this was produced sometime after 1916. In 1917, interestingly, in August 1917, they added film tension springs on the sides, whereas previously the film tension springs had been inside the body compartment. In October 1917, they changed the case lap. So what I know for sure is this was made after August 1917. In October 1917, they changed the case latches to have round milled ends on them. So now I know for sure, for sure that this camera, camera was made after October 1917. In 1920, they added a trigger guard for the shutter release. Well, here's a trigger guard. So I know that this was made after 1920. And lastly, from 1926, so starting in 1926 until the end of the production run in 1934, they changed the coarse leatherette to fine grain. This is coarse grain, which means this camera was produced sometime between 1920 and 1926. And that's the best I will ever be able to date this camera. It still makes it my oldest camera, but there's no way to get a more accurate date on this from anything that I've been able to find so far. So put that together until later. So these little number three brownies were produced in two places. And they were produced either like this one was in Rochester, New York, or they were produced in Canada by uh, the Kodak Bach, uh, wait, no, uh, by Co Canadian Kodak Limited. I could not find where in Canada they were produced, however. Um, but most of them that you'll find, that you're likely to find, will have been made in Rochester. So now, if you have an instruction manual, fine. If not, fine. I couldn't find one online. Uh, honestly, I tried and I couldn't find one. But um, what we'll do is, this is a pretty simple camera, so we'll just go along the, the, uh, around it and we'll t take a look at what all, everything does. On the top of the camera, these two lugs here are for the strap. And mine's missing a strap, but you, you, when you bought it, it would have a strap that said Kodak number 3 Brownie on, on the strap. Then over here we have one of the case latches. This is the uh, instant or time selector switch. This is the aperture uh, switch, and it's not actually a switch, it's a pull bar. So now it's set on time. If it's popped up, it's set on time. If it's pushed in, it's set on instant. If it's if the aperture is, is down all the way, it's F, uh, what was it, what did I say, F8, F16, F22. Did I say F8 or F11? I should memorize these things before I record them. Yeah, it's F, F8, F11, and F22. So all the way down, it's wide open at F8. Also here we have the portrait viewfinder on top. On the side of this, the camera, on this side, we have the landscape viewfinder, the shutter release trigger, a second case latch, and the film advance crank. On the bottom, we have a tripod bushing. On the other side, we have a tripod bushing. On the back, we've got the red window that you would use when to count the number of frames on the roll film, the made in Rochester, New York uh, plaque, and then a stamp that says what size film to use. Now, there were multiple very similar looking brownies. Some used 116, 117, 120, uh, 122, 124. This can use either or. 
the difference between 122 and 124 being just the number of exposures and the size of picture it was intended to take. But 122 can be used in 124 cameras with no issue. Um, so that tells you what size film to use. And on the front, as we've seen, we have the uh, lens opening and the viewfinder openings. These are very simple cameras to work on. Also, if you have one and it's really dirty, this one was filthy last night. Uh, there are four screws on this. You need to take off the four screws in the corners here. There's one in between the viewfinder openings. I did not need to take this off in my camera. I did, but I didn't have to, so you, you might be able to get away with not doing it. And then it's easy to clean this glass. There's two mirrors in here that you can clean, and then two pieces of glass, and then the lens I could not get out. Mine was glued in somehow, but I was able to reach it through the shutter and from behind to clean it. The, um, the stamped metal film holder, this is, this is some really retro construction technology here. The stamped metal film holder is held in with, oops, with nails. Let's see if we can get that in focus. So these are six nails, three on that side, three on that side, that hold the film holder in place. So all I have to do is, is very carefully so as not to, not to damage the, the stamped metal pieces, um, pull up the, film, the nails. I used a very fine screwdriver to do it so that I could get at the back of the, of the lens to clean it. So on the inside of the camera, what you would do is you would put your new film here. And I don't have a roll of 124 or 122 film yet, unfortunately. Uh, I actually just want a roll of 122 tonight. So when I get that, I'll do a video on how to load film. But, uh, so he, this would come loaded up with film and paper backing. And what you would do oops, would be put it in here, and then there's these little metal push buttons on the inside. Push those out drop it in, and then this springs back in place to hold it here. Take the film off, wrap it around, wrap it around, feed it into an, a previously used empty spool, and then put this back into the camera. This only has one spring because this is where the film winding crank, you can see on the side there, plugs in so that the film can be advanced after each frame. Now you might have seen as I was turning this around, that that is quite the large space. This is the size of the negative that it takes. And it takes a three and a quarter inch by four and a quarter inch negative, which is huge. That's large format photography territory. This is a very, very small, large format camera. And to give you an idea of what that means size-wise, that's a sheet of 4x5 film. And it's a little bit larger than the opening, as you can see. Uh, but, not a whole lot. So, one thing you can do for film for these cameras is pick up a bunch of eight, uh, 4x5. Now, you'd of course have to be very careful about covering up the red window here, because that will ruin modern films. And But you could take the 4x5, trim off the excess, set it down here with the emulsion side down, and even potentially put a small piece of tape to make sure that it doesn't go anywhere. Very, very small. And you would have a one-shot camera. To take your picture, you'd have to take it back to a dark room, unload the film, and, and do the whole thing again. But it would be one way to use this camera again. The other thing you can do, and what I'm going to be doing, is I bought an old roll of of exposed but undeveloped film with the paper backing. I'm going to try developing the film. If it works, great. If not, no loss. But the paper backing, I'm then going to re-spool with 120 or 35 millimeter film, depending on just how much of a panoramic image I want, which will allow me to test this lens and have some fun taking photos of it. Because I'll be using the paper backing designed for this camera, all of the number registration will be lined up the same, and at least the images will be the proper width. So, there's some, some room for experimentation there. So lastly, that's, that's really the bulk of the content, but there's a couple other things to say real quickly before we go. And even though this is a pretty durable and well-made camera, and it's mechanically simple, there are a few things you do not want to do. 
you don't want to touch the lens in, from the inside or the outside. Getting fingerprints on these old optics can really damage them. And uh, optical glass is softer than standard glass, so it's more susceptible to damage. And older glass is even more susceptible to cleaning. So assertive cleaning with things like Q-tips, which admittedly is how I cleaned the front of the lens because I couldn't get it out and very gently and carefully. But really, I strongly recommend not using something like a Q-tip on this. And, um, but don't touch the lens unless you absolutely have to to clean it. Don't touch the shutter because you can damage it. Even though it's a metal shutter, it's an old metal. It's going to be fatigued and stressed and could be damaged if you touch it when it's doing its operations. And there's a little spring in there which is exposed to the elements and is a pretty likely failure point if, um, if, you're, uh, if you're messing around with your fingers in there. Uh, do not leave your camera in your car. And even though this is an old camera, it would still be susceptible to heat damage. And even though you won't have the greases and things like that that, it would, that modern cameras would have that would get onto them, you would still have things like the leatherette being damaged by the heat or cold film in it being damaged also, uh, moisture condensing underneath it and rotting the wood. Those could be some really serious issues from leaving your camera in bad conditions, like your basement, or like a plastic bag uh, where you could get fungus. And uh, also, don't let your camera get wet because it is wood. If it gets wet, it's going to warp, and that's a real big problem. And lastly, even though it's an antique camera, it's still a precision piece of equipment. And because it's antique, it's going to be very fragile. So it needs to be treated with a little bit more care than a brand new camera would be handled with. Because it's got some age and some use, and who knows how it's been handled over time. But these cameras are still a lot of fun to use because they're so simple. They're great to teach kids on and great to have fun with yourself. And they take postcard sized images. And as soon as I have images of this, believe me, I'll put a link to it in the video description, but I don't just yet. But um, I've seen photos of these cameras taken. They're still very capable and tons of fun. So that concludes the content of this video. If you have, if, if this video was helpful, give me a thumbs up. That lets me know I'm on the right track and that the content I'm putting together is useful to you guys. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comments section below. And I'll, I respond to them fairly quickly and fairly often. And uh, also, check out the references in the video description because you'll have, there are a lot of links in there that will help you get more information about this camera. And if you have any suggestions also for future videos, let me know. A bunch of my videos that I'm making are suggestions from viewers. And if I have the technical knowledge and the equipment to make one of the, the videos, I would be more than happy to. And the last thing that I want to say before I go is thank you guys for watching.